Hi everybody, today I'm joined by Karina Jordan, who's the Environment Strategy Manager here at Beef and Lamb New Zealand. Some of you may have heard about the National Policy Statement for Indigenous Biodiversity. Uh, Beef and Lamb New Zealand and Federated Farmers are running some workshops at the moment, uh, putting together our own submission and asking, encouraging farmers to, to get involved in the process and make a submission as well if, if they wish to. So what we're going to go on through today is the presentation we've got at the workshops and a bit of discussion between Karina and I. Uh, for those that can't get to a workshop or those that have been to the workshop and want to go back over and get a, a wee bit more detail. So welcome Karina. Um, I'm going to hand over to you in just a minute but I guess um, the nutshell, why should sheep and beef farmers pay attention, go through this video, get involved in the process? Because we've got around about, as a sector, 2.8 million hectares of indigenous vegetation on sheep and beef properties across the country. Mm -hmm. So it's likely that as a landowner, the sheep and beef sector is going to be the most highly impacted by these new set of proposals, which ultimately will result in new rules on the ground that farmers have to meet. Okay. All right, look, there's a lot in this. You and I have just had a quick look through the presentation. As always with policy stuff, the devil's in the detail and there's a whole lot of detail. So let's hook into it. As we go, I might ask the odd question, but um, hit us, what's the, what's the key stuff? I'm gonna give you an overview today of the National Policy Statement on Indigenous Biodiversity. A little bit of a background about how we got to where we are at the moment, how this is gonna be implemented through regional and district plans, I'm going to quickly take you through the main parts of the policy and trying to explain it so that as you as farmers, when you're looking at this, understand what it is, what it means, and in particular, what it means for you and your farming businesses. I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about what Beef and Lamb and Federated Farmers are doing about it and where you can go to find out a little bit more information. It's the 4th of February today, uh, but the clock is ticking on this one, isn't it? When do submissions have to be in by? That's right. Submissions are due 14th of March. So the development of this National Policy Statement on Indigenous Biodiversity has been in about the last two years of making. It was kicked off uh, by a stakeholder group um, that was formed in 2017. The, the governments, or previous governments of the day, had been trying to get a national policy statement for biodiversity for a while and sort of had failed, so this was their approach to engage wider, a wider community in the development of it. Feds were part of that group, along with Forest and Bird, Forest Owners, Environmental Defence Society, and had infrastructure and extractive uses um, in there as well. And as always, with that broad range of views at the table, there were areas that were agreed and other areas that were a little bit more contentious. Um, but at the end of the day, that group came up with a common view and that is supposed to be reflected in the National Policy Statement on Indigenous Biodiversity. And there's definitely some good stuff in there, just some, in some aspects um, what the intent of the policy was from that stakeholder group hasn't really been reflected in, in all of those words. And so we're sort of looking for some subtle changes to it, really. So what, what's a National Policy Statement? What's the point of them? Why not just, I mean, we've got a Resource Management Act to deal with this sort of thing, arguably. Why? Where do national policy statements fit? What's the purpose of yeah, them? Yeah, that, that's, um, that's really interesting. I'm just going to flick to see. I've got actually a slide on that later on, right. uh, but we'll go over it. I'll just flick back there. Uh, we've got, so we manage natural resources under the Resource Management Act in New Zealand. Uh, and then there's some other tools that sit under the Resource Management Act. One of those is a national policy statement. We've got a national policy statement on fresh water, which a lot of our farmers will be aware of. Now, this is a national policy statement on indigenous biodiversity. Uh, the, another, the other national policy statement that we have is for soils, mm -hmm. um, and we'll be talking to farmers a little bit more about where that's going um, in 2020. So we have a Resource Management Act, and we have national policy statement, and then we have regional rules. And essentially the regional councils take their direction from the national policy statement, mm -hmm. and then they implement that at a regional level. Yep. And that's what most of our farmers will be aware of, of those, is those regional processes and the development of those regional mm -hmm. rules. So this to a degree, takes away some regional flexibility. Definitely, that's what it does. So the MPS um, for Indigenous Biodiversity is trying to create some national consistency around how regional regional councils and district councils identify and manage uh, Indigenous habitats mm -hmm. and species in New Zealand. So it, in some way, reduces that flexibility at that, at that more localised level mm -hmm. for more bespoke approaches, mm -hmm. which we're kind of, kind of used to. And so it's got some good things and it's got some bad things. Consistency is generally good because we like consistency across the country, um, but it can preclude you know, approaches which might be more suitable to a community 
um, mm -hmm. in some areas. We have to keep an eye out on that. So what is biodiversity, or in particular indigenous biodiversity? So it just describes the variety and diversity on all life on land and freshwater and in the sea. Um, the indigenous part just means that we're thinking about things that are native or endemic to New Zealand, not introduced by humans. Um, the NPSIB though, it doesn't cover all indigenous biodiversity or species, it only focuses on terrestrial habitats uh, and on wetland habitats, so it doesn't address things like the species that might be found in freshwater or our marine habitats for example. There's general, there is cross-party cross, cross party support for this national policy statement on indigenous biodiversity. Okay. Uh, so it's been you know, sort of a, a collaborative approach, it's uh, supported by a national labour and the Greens and the other parties as well. So there's a strong direction to have an instrument like this in New Zealand and start to identify and protect our indigenous habitats and our species. So what is it and why should I care about it? And we've talked about this a little bit already, mm -hmm. haven't we? But it sets out how regional and district councils will identify and manage habitats and species. Um, and with over 2.8 million hectares of indigenous habitats on sheep and beef farms, it could have a significant impact on how our farmers manage their land and what they can do with their land. And I think that was a key point when I was reading the information, it doesn't matter land tenure, this applies across the lot. That's right, it applies everywhere. Um, and it covers just more than what we would, you know, historically think of as an, a significant natural area or, mm -hmm. or, or piece of habitat. Yep. You know, so we might look at a, a regenerating totra stand or um, forest. Or we might look at a wetland and think, you know, that's a significant area or an area that's got some value. We're going to protect it. But this covers more than just those areas. It covers the areas around those areas. Mm -hmm. And with our farms, we, you know, we farm the pastoral bases around these sort of regenerated areas or even areas that were protected as QE2 so this potentially picks up those areas as well and it also covers uh, mobile species such as mm. bats and birds and things like that and their associated habitats so it really extends mm. how regional councils mm. and district councils have been identifying and managing indigenous habitats um, and it includes restoration requirements in there as well 10% for urban it's unspecified for rural but just a general direction that that regional and district councils need to think about restoration as part of it so the real summary about what this MPS is is it's identify habitats map them make sure you maintain them that could be read as lock it up mm -hmm. uh, and in some instances restore yeah so restore would, you know, 10%, that's a fairly significant target. For, to, for to urban... To near pre-human state, effectively, is that what it's No, it's not. I don't think it's going that far. You've got to remember we have lost a lot of these habitats mm -hmm. in New Zealand, so a 10% in the urban environment isn't really much of a stretch goal, and it's probably quite important because mm -hmm. it says that when we're uh, developing our urban environment, when we've got new development going on, that really when we're doing that development that we should think about indigenous habitats and species mm -hmm. and, and incorporate them into those environments and that's probably pretty important. Okay. Yeah, but we need to be mindful um, of, what, of, that, of what that is and what it means mm -hmm. and we also need to be mindful that we could be asked to restore in the rural environment as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, which could be quite quite a challenge, especially mm. but around our pastoral-based agriculture and the costs of undertaking those sort of activities well. Mm -hmm. uh, but this national policy statement does say that regional and district councils need to engage with their communities on this, so there is the opportunity for that community participation, which is really important. Is that 10% by area, or is that a 10% increase in what's already there? What's the... Is it a 10% of the area? And yeah, that's right. It's okay. a 10% increase on in what's already there. So it does uh, start okay. off with a, you know, what's existing mm. there, what, what, is, what is there now, and then ask for changes from that. And that can be an issue because in some areas where you've got a lot, you're mm. going to have to mm. do a lot more. In other areas where you don't have very much, yeah, then, then the bar's a little bit yeah. lower. Yeah, and so okay. it's not really quite um, the same across all our communities mm. and all places in New Zealand. Mm. Like West Coast might find this a bit challenging because <laughs> yeah. since they've got more indigenous habitats than the Docker state um, and Northland mm. as well where they've got significant, you know, significant areas that are already indigenous and yep. to increase mm. that further. Yeah. So let's talk about the opportunities because it's not all bad. We want to start with some good stuff. So there's a consistent criteria for identifying what these habitats are. There is recognition of existing use rights um, or, you know, mm -hmm. the existing land use that is around those areas um, and recognising that, that what we've been doing in the past we should be able to do going forward, but we shouldn't be able to degrade these habitats or mm -hmm. impact on these habitats anymore. 
There's good recognition of the role of landowners and communities in this conversation as custodians and managers, and I think that's really important because to protect biodiversity going forward, I think it's really going to be that grassroots or, or farmer-led or community-led mm. approaches that are really going to deliver on these outcomes. Could be used as a platform for landowners to add value to their farming business. This is a big conversation, but I just wanted to pop that there for farmers to think about a bit. It's connecting with consumers on the international mm -hmm. level, um, underpinning country of origin brands such as Taste Pure Nature. You can think about it in relation to other policy that's going on at the moment. So indigenous vegetation provides us a way to um, mitigate climate change adapt adapt adaptation. Mm -hmm. It could be a way of offsetting emissions and gaining mm -hmm. credits for those. Um, and we also can get resourcing assistance if we've got these habitats, and that might be things like helping with planting, helping with fencing. Could be recognition that we're providing these values um, at our own cost to a wider community. Uh, it could be help with planting days and things like that. Yep. So, I mean, certainly just to, as we start out, beef and lamb and federated farmers' view is that there's some opportunities in this as well as some potential threats. That's right. Yep. We shouldn't be seeing this as a big negative. We should be looking for the opportunities, though we do need to participate in this conversation uh, because you can be aware that other parts of our communities are engaged in this conversation. They may not see the world as we do. Mm -hmm. And as managers of these habitats and, and large tracts of, of New Zealand's landscape, we very much need to be at the table and I think bring that real practical approach of how you manage these systems within a pastoral-based uh, landscape mm -hmm. is really important. Because yep. I don't think a lock-it-up approach really, at the end of the day, is going to deliver what New Zealand wants and it's mm. definitely not going to benefit our landowners. So we've got some issues. Let's go through some of those. Significant uh, natural areas criteria is really wide and it pretty much will capture most indigenous habitats left in New Zealand and on our farms. Mm -hmm. It also uh, will restrict or could restrict what we do around those areas. Mm -hmm. um, it's got some practical challenges with implementation. I'll talk about this, how the wording of the policy is quite subjective, mean, meaning that it's a little bit uncertain about how some of this is going to be landed by regional district mm -hmm. councils, which can be a bit of an issue could constrain existing activities and it's likely to preclude or stop any new land uses or future activities within or even adjacent to these areas. Mm -hmm. And like I talked about it before, it's got a wide reach so it also covers mobile species as well and there's some restoration requirements in there. Yep. So the process from here, we talked about this right at the beginning. What is the national policy statement? It, it, it directs what regional councils have to do in their local areas and in shaping their rules um, and that applies to farmers. We're at the submission stage where communities get to have their say on what the national policy statement um, looks like at the end of the day. Once we've had our say, then the government will uh, make final decisions on that mm -hmm. and they'll release it. Once it's operative, then regional and district councils need to have a good look at it and they need to go through a plan change process to make sure that they're putting it in place on the ground. And so what that means for our communities is that um, regional councils and district councils will be going through their regional plans or district plans. They'll be making changes to those regional district plans. Mm -hmm. Those will go out for the community to submit on them. So it's mm -hmm. another submission process. And then they'll be made um, operative and uh, farmers will have to do essentially what they say or meet the, meet the new yep. rules. Um, if they're contentious, it might go to a hearing. So it can be a long, drawn-out process. So Yeah, so it's hard to be precise. I mean, roughly, what are we talking here? I mean, obviously, you said there's a bit of reasonably political consensus, so the upcoming election isn't likely to change this too much. Not significantly, but no. allowing that, that means it's almost certainly going ahead one shape or another. What sort of time frame, you know, for when, say, we get to that point where we plan change stage there on you? Program. It's really hard to say how long this is going to take, but there is a requirement under the National Policy Statement for regional and district councils to have these habitats mapped within five years. So okay. as with fresh water, they're trying to fast yep. track this stuff through. Uh, and we know that regional councils for fresh water will have to be undertaking plan changes uh, in the next sort of three years mm -hmm. and have them operative within the next five. Um, yep. uh, they might want to look for efficiency, so they might do uh, biodiversity and fresh water at mm. the same time. So you could see them under quite short time frames, but yeah. definitely within 10. Yeah, so even shorter time. Submissions so close 14th of March. Um, what's the time frame after that before the national policy statement becomes, what is it, formal, adopted? What's the term? I, don't know, I think, becomes yeah, it becomes operative, operative probably mid-2019. 
2020. Okay, well, yeah. Quite up, yeah, yeah, I'd say. That's quick. Yep, so we'll see something land uh, by the end of the year. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to get into some of the policy detail. We've got quite a bit of information on the slides that's done on purpose so that farmers can take them away and have a look at them, think about mm -hmm. them, and use them as a resource when they're doing their own submissions yep. or when they're looking through the policy. I'll try and summarise them, though, when I speak to each slide and hopefully make them a little bit clearer. And we'll put links to all this in the description, either of the video or if this does, it will also get turned into the podcast. It'll be there. And on the Beef and Land New Zealand website, there's pages with links to fact sheets, the major documents. Is this presentation available as well? Or going we to we can make this presentation okay. available oh. as well. So the key topics I'm going to talk about first is I'm going to talk I'm going to explain why the national policy statement is a little bit unclear sometimes and, and what it says, and that relates to the precautionary principle. So just bringing up a new word there. There's some good stuff, uh, and the stuff we like about it is that it recognises people as important in the in the in the environment and as managers, and it recognises social and cultural well-being is really important as well, and it's good that we're taking that approach, that we're realising that we're not just managing habitats and species, but that we're providing across well-being, so that's community, individual and environmental well-being. What are we managing? We're, we're managing these areas called significant natural areas, and I'll explain what they are and how mm -hmm. they're going to be defined. And what are we managing? We're managing existing activities and new activities. Mm -hmm. That includes in the rural environment and the urban environment and also talks to a bit about some spatial planning in relation to the urban environment as well. What else? It's a bit broader than just SNAs. It talks about mobile species as well and there's some requirement to put some stuff back. Mm -hmm. Let's just start with the precautionary principle. What this generally says is that if you don't know what the effects of something are or if you're not quite sure what the values of something are, then be precautionary about what it is you're managing and how you're managing it. What that means is that, and the precaution lies in favour of the environment. So if you're uncertain of something that's going to have an effect, don't allow that activity to, yeah. to happen. Okay. Yeah, put the environment first is what this says. And there's a lot that we don't know about biodiversity. And so there's a little, there's a lot of, areas that are coming through with the national policy statement is it's quite a, sort of unclear about how they're going to land on the ground mm. and I'd really encourage farmers to have a good look at that because where regulation is going is that and we know this is it's becoming more draconian in nature mm. it's not becoming um, more user friendly or it's not becoming more subjective it's becoming more top down more this is what you can and can't do so we need to be careful when instruments like a national policy statement are written in, in sort of quite a subjective way or there's a lot of uncertainty about how it's really going to land on the ground. So you're almost, in a way, this is almost a guilty until proven innocent. Like you have to prove or the, that there are no significant biodiversity effects of an activity before it can go ahead rather than assuming you have That's to prove right. that there will be impact. That's right. It is, it is a little bit, it, yeah. it's a bit like that first, definitely. Some good stuff. Uh, we, uh, the NPSIB identifies that people are critical to maintaining and enhancing indigenous biodiversity. Mm -hmm. um, that really conservation starts from the ground up and mm -hmm. to get the best conservation outcomes it's about landowners uh, valuing these habitats and having really good tools in relation to how they manage these mm -hmm. habitats going forward and also about communities and their role that they play mm -hmm. on this. I know New Zealand's um, aiming for um, predator-free mm -hmm. by 2050. That's not going to occur without some significant investment by individuals and communities. Yep. It's beyond what DOC or just the government can mm -hmm. do themselves. It's going to take a whole of New Zealand approach to this. So it's important in this, we've just identified objective six. So just when you're thinking about policy, policy delivers on its objective. So the objective is, this is what we want to achieve. And then the policies go, this is how we're going to achieve them. Mm -hmm. So the objectives are really important. And objective six in particular, which allows people to provide for their social, economic and cultural wellbeing mm -hmm. now and in the future. So it's a really important one that we need to be positive about. Yeah. So that, that the economic outcomes and wellbeing is specifically allowed for in there as well. It's there's a good objective here yep. that we can hinge some changes to some of the words in the policy off, um, but some of the policy doesn't quite deliver on that. Okay. It, it, it will put Indigenous biodiversity um, before uh, yep. communities, and so we just need to think about that as we're working through. 
So let's just talk about what their significant natural areas are. So there's a standardised approach in this national policy statement about the identification of these habitats. So all regional councils and district councils will have to go through and map these habitats. They need to map them within five years. Mm -hmm. uh, they're encouraged or, or directed, I suppose, to talk to landowners about that. Uh, but I'll talk to uh, I'll talk a little bit in later on about the implications of that or the restrictions on it. Uh, what we know is that there's limited expertise in New Zealand, and if all regional district councils have to do this within five years, it's unlikely we're going to have the expertise to be able to go and ground truth all these habitats or talk to farmers. So there's some resource constraints there that but might have might be significant. It's not necessarily starting from zero, though. I mean, this is something that councils have done, but. I think you're, next, you're actually going to talk about it in this slide. The, the criteria of changing is going to make it a bigger job or a more detailed job than it has been. And it removes the ability for regional or district variability in how they do this. I mean, the, the courts have been thinking about this for a little while, so that's created some consistency already, and regional and district councils are doing it. But this really just says you have to do it everywhere. You have to do yep. it under pretty tight time frames, and, and this is the consistent approach that we're going to take yep. to, do, to do that. So that criteria, um, I encourage you to go look at the NPSIB and actually spend some time because this is probably one of the most important parts mm -hmm. of it, is that the habitat needs to needs to be representative of that habitat type um, historically. Uh, if the habitat's rare or it's distinct in its own right, uh, if it's if it's healthy and it's got a good pat level of pattern in it. Mm -hmm then that would classify it as being a significant natural area. Um, and its ecological context, that's the species that live in it um, and how it fits into the wider landscape. And so these are really broad, uh, this is a really broad set of criteria. And when you look at them and you think about our habitats in New Zealand and our species, it pretty much means that any remaining habitat is likely to be considered a significant yeah. natural area. Because I think you were saying at the start that threshold is lowered a wee bit, it just has to be one of those. D yes, it's, uh, the, the habitat only needs to meet one criteria for yeah. it to be considered significant. Which is a lower threshold than That's right. Using. Yes. Yeah. So a little bit what we've already talked about, councils are already on their way. So they're already required to identify and protect indigenous habitats. This just says you need to do it within five years. It sets out that consistent criteria mm -hmm. that regional and district councils have to use. It says that you have to map it, um, but but and it also provides for like a partnership opportunity with landowners about those habitats where they are and how they're mapped. So that part is really good, but just might be a bit difficult to apply that on the ground with our limited expertise. Mm -hmm. So it's likely that regional councils will resort or district councils will re resort to some spatial mapping mm -hmm. tools to help them do that, and that doesn't often always pick up the health of those mm. environments. Yep. So managing the effects, and I think this is what um, landowners will be really interested about. They're like, well, I've got some habitats, I know they're, they're mm. going to meet that criteria, so what? Yep. So what that means for you is that um, it might limit what you can do, in those, or definitely limit what you can do in those areas, and it may limit what you can do around those areas. So managing effects on significant natural areas, it applies to new subdivision, use and development, it applies to any new activities, and the bar around that is really high. Uh, and if you look at that criteria, it's quite subjective. Uh, for example, we know that grazing animals, uh, or new grazing of animals around or adjacent to these areas can dampen down the ability for these areas to um, regrow, grow or restore. Mm -hmm. uh, sheep in particular, you know, eating seedlings and mm -hmm. things like that, it stops that restoration. Yep. Or enhancement cycle in some of these habitats and that could be seen as disrupting or fragmenting or reducing these habitats. Mm. Uh, manage means means manage, um, avoid means don't don't do it. So yeah. manage means you can do things around it, you might be able to mitigate activities, but avoid means you just can't do it. And, so and we're not likely to see any new activities um, yeah. being and, being provided for in regional district councils within these habitats. How do you Definitely prove it's and not adjacent yeah. to? And how do you prove it's not new? Well, That's quite yeah. difficult. There's a large bar for that for yeah. that loan donor, and we know with our some of our farming systems, they're quite that the rotational basis of them can be can be long. Mm. For example, with our hill country farmers um, and in hill country development, you can have regenerating manuka and kanuka mm. and things like that, and some other species coming up through. And it may be seven years or longer before the farmer gets around to clearing that mm. um, or changing the pasture species. So we need to be mindful of 
of what that means, this means in relation to some of those longer term rotational yeah. activities that we t and undertake. And proving um, prior use will be a real... It, yep, exactly. So existing activities in significant natural areas. The stakeholder group did consider and talk about this quite a lot and the approach or the intent that they had was that existing activities could carry on mm -hmm. in and around these areas. Uh, just the policy might not quite reflect that, it might be a bit tougher than, mm. than what was envisioned by the stakeholder group, so it's important to go back and have another look at that. It talks about the activity having the same character, intensity and scale as what was mm -hmm. done historically, and that's going to be a hard bar for people to prove mm. in relation to these habitats and the impact that that activity might have on that yeah. habitat. For example, the grazing of animals around those habitats. Yeah. Um, councils can specify where, how and when other other activities happen or, or, or what can be undertaken. Existing activities must not lead to a loss, including cumulative loss or degradation of the significant natural areas. Ecological integrity, mm -hmm. that's a really wide bar. Mm -hmm. That talks about the habitat and how it engages with the environment around it and the species that mm -hmm. coexist with that habitat as well. And you can't change the scale of what you've done in the past compared to what you're going to do in the future. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. So, I mean, you because you're going to come on, I think, to mobile species and things, but you know, one pet, a significant natural area may be completely unaffected what you do, but that may affect the link to another habitat somewhere that's else. Right, that's right, a connected like habitat, yeah. yeah, and maybe species that use mm. both of those habitats. Yeah. And in some mm. context, um, a habitat needs to be a certain size for it to be self-sustaining. Mm. When habitats get down to quite a small size, you can generally lose them because they just yeah. don't have their seed bank to repopulate or, or carry on their life cycle. So there's tipping points in relation to these habitats. Mm. We want to maintain these habitats, but we want clear recognition that the maintenance and protection of them coexists with pastoral ag agricultural yeah. and, our, and our pastoral mm. landscapes, that it doesn't preclude, they're not separate from. So that goes on to areas around SNAs, and so there's controls on subdivision, use and development in areas um, adjacent to these to maintain biodiversity. Uh, you can offset and compensate for some of the effects, um, but that's not the same across communities. So there's a, a, an ability to offset um, impacts from the urban environment, wow. but not necessarily the, the same ability to offset impacts on within the rural environment. So the issue there is we could get um, transfer of impact really in urban environment could try and offset its impact in relation to loss of indigenous habitats onto a rural environment. There's something to be mindful of. An area outside of this significant natural area can become a significant natural area yeah. essentially by, by proximity. We don't know how big those borders are though, so you can't say, you know, is it a mm. metre around that significant natural area or is it a kilometre that's, um, that's left up to you know, the individual identification of the area and its values. So this means that if we've got farms that have pockets of, of indigenous habitats, and we know that a lot of our especially more mosaic landscapes and farming systems do, they'll yeah. have regenerating scrub and all the gullies and things like that. It could really impact on, on that pastoral-based activity you know, on the, on the more rolling land yeah. or flatter land mm -hmm. around those areas. And yeah, not necessarily just the property that's on. But. That's right, adjacent properties as well. Yeah. So you can have impacts of one property and, you know, I'm going to talk about mobile fa mm. uh, fauna in a minute and what that means for that adjacent landowner as well. So highly, highly mobile fauna. So these are, you know, charismatic or, or fauna that are considered to be significant in New Zealand. They need to be indigenous. And this just talks about the role of the Regional District Council to identify uh, those species the requirements that those species have to um, maintain their population mm. and be healthy and to ensure that uh, regional and district councils are managing those those requirements yeah. for those species. The good part of this though is that there is strong recognition that um, exper experts should come and talk to landowners about um, species, for example, bats that they've found on their mm. property and, and how to manage the well-being of yeah. those species. And so that I think all farmers would be pretty open to having, come, mm. have an expert come and talk about you know some of the 
amazing biodiversity that they might have on their property and how they can integrate that into their farming system and, and protect it. But it's sort of that integration part that's important, I think, is for it, farmers to get through through the submission process. Is that expertise, that resource there, or is this going to be something that's going to have to be developed as well? You know, to, to I think it's advice. a little bit like build it and they will come, I yeah. think. So I think in New Zealand at the moment we've got amazing expertise um, within, the, within the country, mm-hmm. though probably not to the extent needed to assist all regional district councils or yeah. landowners. Yeah. Uh, with how they are going to identify and manage the, these habitats and these species. Um, but the upside of that is, is, is if there's a requirement for regional district councils, then hopefully we're building that expertise mm. in New Zealand and actually we're building it within our farm as well. As well. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a positive, mm. but it's just how do we get there? What's the, yeah. what's the time frame? Because five years is pretty tight and we mm. don't have those sort of, that sort of capacity in New Zealand at the moment. There's also a requirement to increase vegetation cover, and I talked about the 10% increase mm-hmm. in the urban environment and the yeah. undefined in, in the rural environment. This just says that regional district councils need to go and talk to their communities. In the urban environment, they need to um, be able to set out targets to increase the area under indigenous habitats by 10%. For rural areas, it's not set. They need to go and talk to the rural communities and, and work out what the restoration threshold or targets will be. And that's essentially a biggie. You know, we talked at, right at the start the survey of just how much we already have on sheep and beef farms. So that is a 10% increase on that. We'd be really concerned about that. Yeah. It's the, it's, you know, you've got a starting point and then you're going to protect, maintain or enhance from that point. Mm. The issue being could be that those that have done the most yeah. bear the greatest costs. And as with fresh water, that's an approach that um, Beef and Emma in particular does not support. So we need to ensure that with indigenous habitats or, and species, that where they're degraded, we mm. we've lost them. That's where we focus. Yeah. Um, and where we've got them, that's where we should be maintaining. But those yeah. landowners should be rewarded or incentivised or recognised for the great work that they've done to date. It's the G word again, grandparent. Grandparenting, yeah. yeah. So the potential issues around the restoration is that the language could suggest that it becomes compulsory or mandatory, it's a legal obligation. Um, so we could see the legal requirement for farmers to do to put more mm. to put more land back under mm-hmm. indigenous habitats. And with the way that this set up, it means that you need to essentially establish those habitats or those communities um, and then protect them. So mm. we'll preclude pastoral based farming from them. Our position is that restoration activities essentially should be non regulatory and should be done hand in hand with landowners and communities mm-hmm. uh, with support yep. um, and a clear understanding of why, where and how. Mm-hmm. And it should focus on, on those habitats that we've lost and, and where the greatest need for the restoration yep, of indigenous habitats and, and species are. And there's general concern that the NPS treats communities differently, mm-hmm. urban are different from rural, mm-hmm. and, and activities different from each other as well. So there's different sort of requirements for plantation forestry compared to other people. Okay. And there's the ability for you know urban development to offset mm. in particular. And so from Beth and Land's perspective and Federated Farmers would be liking to, would prefer to see an approach that was equitable across communities yep. and activities. So that what we've talked about is there is a lack of expertise in New Zealand in, in relation to these requirements, you know, mapping five years and then implementation mm-hmm. of new management frameworks. We need to be building that expertise, but we also need to be addressing, you know, what that means, the lack of it in New Zealand right now. There is going to be a cost to landowners mm-hmm. of, of doing mm-hmm. this, and the cost is going to be likely increased from what we've seen in the past. It could preclude some activities from adjacent to those areas and definitely within those areas. Um, and it could tie up large parts of, of our pastoral-based agricultural land, mm. especially those areas with large areas of indigenous habitats within them. Yeah, particularly because, you know, as there's so much already there, and particularly on some farms, and then the, the significant natural area approach plus the area around, area it. Area around it, it actually the multiplier gets really large. That's right, yeah. Um, so, so what's Beef, uh, Beef and Lamb and Federated Farmers? Why are we engaged in this conversation and what are we looking for? We're looking for outcomes that are fair. We're looking for a policy that does provide a bit of certainty. And that's because uh, as landowners, we need certainty about what's required of us and especially into the future so that we can make sound business decisions mm-hmm. and investment decisions. There needs to be recognition of the good work that we've done already that landowners have done already and the role that they play in in actually protecting and restoring these habitats moving forward and the species moving forward. Uh, It needs to be led from the ground up, so farmers empowered and communities empowered. 
It needs to build resilient communities. And, and overall, we're looking for policy that recognises, rewards and incentivises biodiversity work on farm, that treats it as a positive and doesn't create it as a liability for the farmer. The last thing we want to see is a mobile species considered to be a liability to, yeah, to a business. That's right. that's right, that would be a perverse outcome. So, um, side question here, and you know, farmers like to see their representatives work together and Beef and Lamb and Federal. Side by side on, on the national policy yeah, statement and our work programs. We Currently I'll talk about what we're doing going forward, but we are running workshops across the country mm -hmm. jointly. Uh, I think there's about five in the North Island and five yep. in the South Island. We had our first one last night, I understand, but the one we had tonight has been rained out, so we'll probably <laughs> need to reschedule that at some stage. But we're hoping that this podcast uh, helps farmers that yep. aren't able to get to one of those workshops also engage in this conversation because it is complex and especially because... The way the policy is worded, it's, it's quite subjective and, and it can be uncertain in parts. Yep. And we'll put the links to those in the blurbs. Definitely. So just a couple of last slides and then, and then we'll be finished. These are a little bit wordy, but pretty much what we're looking for is biodiversity and private land. That's a positive for landowners, not a negative. Um, protection and enhancement of Indigenous biodiversity is enabled within pastoral-based landscapes. So it's not treated as something separate recognise that uh, for Indigenous habitats and biodiversity to be sustained in the future, they need to be embedded into our landscapes and, and our activities. That the benefits provided by Indigenous bio biodiversity are understood by farmers and they're able to be realised by farmers. And there's significant values here beyond, you know, beyond the economic well-being of a business, but it's about offsetting greenhouse gas emissions, so it could be about helping meet other policy requirements. Uh, it's about can be about climate change adaptation, can improve um, how communities think about farmers and the value they put mm -hmm. put on farming. We talk, we use social license when we talk about that. Can be used to underpin and strengthen up country of origin branding and therefore uh, markets in relation mm -hmm. to that and potentially add value yep. in relation to our products as well. And really, at the end of the day, it's about the recognition of these integrated landscapes. So landscapes that are diverse, where biodiversity is embedded within them, and we were provided multiple values to, to the farmer and to our community. So the economic value, as, as well as um, those other values that we started to talk about. So Beef and Lamb and Feds are running a roadshow at the moment. Uh, pop online, you can go either online to Federated Farmers or Beef and Lamb and have a look at where those, those schedule for those roadshows. We're working with Dairy NZ and the other agricultural teams. We're also talking to the ministries and the ministers on this. And our understanding from our communications to date is that they're really open to looking at changes to this policy, mm -hmm. which ensure that it works for our landowners okay. and that it empowers communities. So we've got a, an open ear at the moment to looking for pragmatic changes, which actually deliver uh, what we want as New Zealand, which is really nice to see and a little bit different than what we've seen in other policy processes. Do you think that, that has become, that attitude is because we do have good evidence of just how much Indigenous biodiversity is on commercial sheep and beef farms? I think there's this growing realisation that to achieve environmental outcomes you need landowner buy-in mm -hmm. and you don't get it by having a, a fraught, yep. draconian process based on conflict mm -hmm. that at the end of the day the outcomes will be achieved by all of us working mm -hmm. together and that farmers bring you know the expertise to the table on how to manage these yeah. things because they've been managing them mm -hmm. for a long time Avoid those. and that it's partnership opportunities that really open the gate I think We um, will be doing a submission. We will also be providing a, a template or resources to help farmers do a submission. Mm -hmm. In our workshops, the second part of our workshop, we actually take farmers how to do a submission. Great. Uh, we'll hopefully be doing, we'll live stream at least a couple of those workshops. We're thinking uh, that we'll do the Masterton one, which is on the 11th of Feb, mm -hmm. and we're looking at one in Taranaki as well. So what can farmers do? Be informed is the most important thing. Pick up the national policy statement, have a look. Uh, maybe uh, uh, read the presentations that Beef and Lamb and Federated Farmers are, are putting out there and think about them. Talk to your neighbours, talk to your communities about, about this. Uh, rock up to one of our workshops and, and have a look and engage us in a conversation and your peers in a conversation about what this means. 
and talk to your local MP district and regional councils about it as well. Also, contact us if you've got any case studies on your farms or good examples about mm-hmm. what you've got and how you've been managing it. It's, it's that, that face-to-face, all those on-the-ground stories that really resonate, mm-hmm. and it'd be quite nice to actually build them into some of the industry submissions that we're putting mm-hmm. forward, that, that farmer story it's about great. what biodiversity is and what it means to them and how they've been protecting it. Mm-hmm. And where do you go for more info? I think we're going to be providing some links, but there's great info on the Ministry for the Environment website. They've also got a really short summary of their discussion documents, about five pages, I think, so well worth picking up and having a look at. Federated Farmers and Beef and Lamb have got information on their websites, including a joint fact sheet, which summarises a lot of this information as well. Uh, And you can submit online. You can also write a submission and post it in, um, and you can email submissions in, so any sort of approach that you like to take is open to you. And just if you need to contact us, here's some contacts. Is that we've got plenty of contacts at Beef and Lamb and, and plenty of contacts at Federated Farmers. So if you need to, pick up the phone and give us a call. Brilliant. So that you summarised the call to action pretty nicely there, which is what I was going to wrap up with. As well as the written submissions, is it likely that people, is there going to be um, you know, in-person submissions? Verbal ones? Are they, is there going to be hearings, et cetera? Or is this... I don't know at this stage, so okay. I can't answer that. Yet some processes you can speak to your mm. submission. I'm not sure. Okay. But in terms, so that's getting involved in the process, putting in people having their say, finding out about having their say, thinking you know locally while acting, or thinking nationally but acting locally. What sort of things for farmers on their own farms should they be thinking about starting to do now? I mean, is this uh, um, tallying some of the stuff up part of the farm environment planning, the farm planning process, and that sort of thing? That's just more Definitely. fuel for farmers to get into that. I th- I think so. Um, I mean, there's a little big conversation happening nationally about farm planning. Mm. If I was going to provide a b- advice about that, I, I think I'd say that every farmer should have a farm plan. You're going to need one in the future, so get on the journey. Mm. I think under your farm plan, then map these areas mm-hmm. and have a plan about how you're going to sustainably manage them. Yep. Being able to show we're proactive, proactive, we value these areas, and we've got a plan for how we're going to do it. That's bespoke to you know yep. the farm and the aspirations of that farmer is really important. Yep. And I know we do a lot of pest management in these areas already, so just documenting that is quite powerful. Yep. Don't wait for yeah somebody to either. Don't wait for regulation. Come and look over your fence and say right, we're going to do X to you because you've got that land. That's right, and just remember that sometimes when regulation hits on the ground financial assistance around that regulation dries up. Mm-hmm. So if you've got some indigenous habitats and you've been planning on fencing them or talking to an expert about them, I recommend that you get onto that pretty quick smart. Brilliant. All right, good place to wrap up there, I think. Thank you very much. Karina Jordan, Environment Strategy Manager at Beef and Lamb New Zealand. As I say, the links are on the screen, but we'll put them in the blurb so you can click on them, read more. The key point there was to be proactive and get involved. Don't let this stuff happen to us, but we want to we want to be part of the process. So if you've sat through this video, that's already part of it. By all means, if you've sat through this, still go to a workshop because you can't beat that one-to-one, face-to-face sort of discussion, which you'll get there. Um, but the links are there, the contacts are there. Um, get involved, and if in doubt, give us a call, and we'll try and find you an answer. Karina, thanks very much for your time. Thank you.